recording. Excellent. So uh, today is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Uh, we are continuing our mystical magical journey through the digestive system. We're halfway through the digestive system and halfway through our lectures. So that works about right. Uh, so we'll continue our discussion of that today. Uh, we have some more anatomy and histology that I want to spend some time talking about today uh, to help us to prepare for uh, the exam one week from today. Uh, we have one more assignment to do. You had a couple due today, but one more to uh, do, and that is going to be on Thursday, your labster. Again, it's the intestinal glucose transport. It's a fun little activity. Uh, make sure you complete the entire activity and get at least 80% correct for full credit. Also, we should finish the lecture early, both today and on Thursday. Uh, this is a section that, depending on the semester, it takes about three and a half lectures to do this. And some, because of the way the holidays fall, sometimes we only have three days for it. Some days we have four days. We have four days for it this time. So uh, we're not as packed on time as we normally is, and that's a good thing. So that's why, again, we'll have more time to talk about anatomy and histology. Uh, and I'll have the opportunity to answer any questions that you guys have on Thursday. Again, come prepared to ask questions for the exam. Remember, if you don't ask questions at the exam, then I assume you've all mastered the material and I make the exam harder. And that's it. One week from today, we have the lab and lecture exam. You have taken two of those now, so you know what to expect. You know what it's like. Uh, you know what you need to do to be successful on those, hopefully. And uh, so uh, again, the same way I wrote the first two tests is how I wrote this test. Uh, and so you're just going to uh, take it, hopefully, uh, either the same way or have learned from those previous ones to help you to be successful. All righty. Questions on any of that? Well, can I ask um, what exactly distinguishes the circular muscle from the sphincters? So uh, the short answer to that is nothing. A sphincter is uh, an enlargement of the circular layer. So in some regions, so again, all of the, uh, Vu, I see your question too. So let me answer this one first. So again, we have two layers to the muscularis a circular layer that is closer to the lumen and a longitudinal layer. When a sphincter forms, basically what happens is there is an increase in the amount of smooth muscle in that circular layer. So that basically what happens is that at that location, the enlargement of the circular layer, when it constricts, is actually going to be able to close the lumen, basically forming a valve that can regulate the flow. Mm -hmm. But that's what, a, so a sphincter is just an enlargement of the circular layer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, Vu mentioned that there are some lecture images from the past two lectures that are not on Canvas. Uh, again, remember, I, I post these lectures uh, at really close to the beginning of the semester, and I do tinker with them some. Many of the in images that I use come from your textbook or your lab manual. Although I don't I'll limit myself to that. Again, uh, one of the advantages of having taught this for as many years as I have and as many different schools as I have is different schools use different textbooks. And if sometimes if there's something that um, I really like in another textbook, I don't mind using it if I think it shows the obvious example. Also, again, remember those outlines that I'm posting are just static images of the slides, whereas many of the slides are dynamic with information populating in different ways. So it's impossible to add that dynamic aspect to the slides without making them incredibly long. Uh, what I would uh, uh, encourage you is that the, the advantage of this format that we're doing right now is you have a recording of all the lectures. So if there's something on a slide that, that you feel you don't have in your textbook or another resource, you do have that ability uh, to go back to the uh, recording on YouTube and uh, you know, take a view or take a screenshot from it or something like that as well to help you to get that information. Oh, uh, well, I don't remember. So I don't remember drawing anything that. Let me see if I can. Should still have those. Oops, hold on. I can do that. Um, whoops. 
I don't know where the, I'll have to look at it during the break. Uh, if I'm just writing stuff out, I figure that's the stuff that you should be writing as well. I don't remember doing any drawings, uh, but um, I'll look and see if I've got any screenshots that I saved and uh, put those up there there. But, but the short version is usually if we're, if we're just talking about the material or if I'm just writing out sentences or descriptions or things along those lines, uh, those aren't the things that I think that are necessary to, to post because you should be doing that anyway. And again, I don't want you memorizing my words. I want you putting all this information in your own words. But if there was a particular picture or something, uh, then I usually do try to save that. I don't remember. Uh, was there a particular image that you were thinking of? But yes, yeah, yeah, that is true too. Is there, if I didn't save it, it is always something you can go back to in the recordings as well. But I'll look during the next break. Well, you should be able to tell me what the potential essay questions are for the exam. Again, at this point, halfway through 431, having gone through all of 430 and half of 431, you should be able to look at the lectures and be able to determine the things uh, that, that are important. Again, the things we spend time, the things that we talk about are the things that are going to be important. Those are the things that could potentially be essay questions. And being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, you guys should be able to see that. Anything that has categories that can be described, anything that has processes that have steps, all of those are the types of things that are important and can be on the exam. Again, it's, uh, my goal isn't to stand here and tell you all the possible essay questions, one, because there's a lot of them, uh, but, but two, because again, it, it would be recreating the lecture, because the point is everything we talk about is something that could potentially be on an exam. Now, obviously, some smaller points probably lend themselves more to lab exams or multiple choice questions, but any of the big concepts, big processes, things like that are all things that could be on the exam. So at this point, I shouldn't have to tell you that. You should be able to tell me the things that are possible essay questions. All right. All right. Any other questions? All right, we left off last time and we had talked about the anatomy and some of the function of the uh, intestines. Uh, but what we need to do now, did all that, did all that, here we go, is we need to talk some about the uh, uh, mechanical activities, the movements of the small intestine that take place. Um, Here's what I would say to that. I don't go through everything in the book. If you actually go and read the textbook, you will see that there is actually a tremendous amount of information in the textbook that I don't talk about in class. Uh, so uh, I think the outlines are a very obvious study guide. Again, one of the things I love about this class is that it is hard. And because it's hard, I don't have to be tricky. So the more time we spend on a concept, uh, the more important that concept is, the more likely it's gonna be on the essay question. You should be able to look through the lecture slides and be able to figure out uh, what kind of concepts. Here, I'm getting ready to talk about intestinal movements or the different types of movements that are available in the intestine, something that could potentially be an essay question. Absolutely, right? Now I agree in that um, there are a lot of essay questions. From every lecture, you could probably come easily come up with a half dozen essay questions, at least, uh, that could come from that. And obviously, all of those can't be on the exam, but they uh, much of it will be represented in one way or another on there. So that's the nature of the class. But yeah, there is a lot of material. And again, we're barely scratching the surface of what the body actually is. There's so much more. You got to remember every single concept we talk about in this class, we could easily spend a month talking about. So everything we talk about is so much more complicated than we get a chance to get into in this class. But that's why you guys are all going on to bigger and better things where you'll get to, to learn about when the sky is gray and the sky is purple and the sky is black and the sky is orange. All right, let's talk about the movements of the small intestine. Obviously, we know peristalsis is going to take place in here. However, if you remember, we also talked about this process called segmentation. Segmentation is where you have the alternating contractions of the circular layer. This type of alternating contractions isn't alternating between circular and longitudinal like we get in peristalsis. Right, and that peristalsis, as we mentioned, is for propulsion. But 
What we have here with segmentation is much more of a mechanical digestion. It actually serves many important functions, right? The one thing it doesn't do is propulsion. There is very limited propulsion. Uh, being done, I don't know why that needs to be so big, uh, being done with segmentation. Instead, basically what is happening is the chyme, because remember at this point that it is being presented to the small intestine, our food is now chyme, is being pushed back and forth. That helps to aid in the mechanical digestion, helping to again continue to mix up uh, that chyme. But it also uh, helps with the chemical digestion as well, right? What it does is pushes it in contact by mixing and swirling the food around. We're able to mix it more with the enzymes that are being released from the pancreas. And as someone mentioned last time, remember those microvilli on the surface of the cells were called brush border. And those brush borders actually have many enzymes as well. So pushing the food back and forth across that increases its surface area, meaning that it's more in contact with those enzymes and that helps in the chemical breakdown of it as well. As well as if we take it and rub it back and forth across the surface of the wall of the small intestine, that's gonna help to facilitate um, absorption as well. So this segmentation, uh, which we think of as mechanical digestion, really helps in a lot of functions of the small intestine. Now that doesn't mean that we need to move, food. we don't have to move through, through, let me try that again. That doesn't mean that we don't have to eventually move the food through the small intestine. And of course, for that, we have that peristalsis, which we've already talked about, where you have alternating contractions between the circular and the longitudinal layer of the small intestine. But there are some other mechanical activities that we've kind of talked about as well. One is what is known as the gastroileal reflex. Remember, we talked about how the stretch of the stomach uh, increases the motility and the secretion in the small intestine. But also, remember, with the help of that hormone gastrin, causes the ileocecal valve to relax. Remember, this is our way of saying the telling the small intestine. The stomach tells the small intestine, hey, I have a bunch of new food inside of me. So the goal now is to get what you have inside of you right now out small intestine because I've got more food coming your way. So that helps to move the food along through the small intestine into the large intestine uh, so that we can make room to process more food as it comes through. Again, depends on the volume of food, the composition of the food that you eat can cause it to vary greatly. But in general, the small intestine empties in somewhere between three and six hours. All right, questions on that? Um, it, does segmentation only happen in the small intestine or does it also happen in the large intestine? Great question. No, uh, segmentation only happens in the small intestine. All right, churning only happened in the stomach because of that third layer. Uh, segmentation only happens here in the small intestine. And when we get to the large intestine, we'll learn that the large intestine has a couple of movements that are unique to it as well. All right. Questions on that? All right. As we mentioned, the small intestine is the true workhorse of our alimentary canal, where a vast majority of the chemical and mechanical absorption processing of our food takes place. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't get help. To help it, we have several accessory organs that we see here. Here, finally, we have a nice picture of that pancreas. Again, we see it's got this enlarged head and body and tail-like structure. And remember, as we talked about, the head and body are all retroperitoneal, whereas the tail kind of sticks out a little bit into the intraperitoneal cavity. Notice it's not surprising it's retroperitoneal when you see how the duodenum of the small intestine wraps around that head. 
And we of course know that the small intestine or the duodenum of the small intestine is retroperitoneal as well. We also have the liver, our largest uh, visceral organ in an adult and the gallbladder, which is associated with it as well. But let's talk first about the pancreas. The pancreas is something we have some familiar with. We've looked at it before. Before we primarily were focused on this structure here. What's this structure here again? Endocrine gland. True, it is an endocrine gland and it is that pancreatic islet containing the alpha cells and the beta cells. And remind me again what the alpha cells do. Uh, produce glucose, glucose. Excellent. And the beta cells? Uh, insulin. Insulin. Excellent. Perfect. Remember also, we also saw out here all of these dark stained ball shaped secretary structures that we called the pancreatic acini or alveoli. And we mentioned how these have an exocrine function. Here on our pancreas, you can actually see the large duct that runs down the center of the pancreas. And actually that main duct actually comes out and releases into the uh, duodenum at the same location where the liver and gallbladder release it uh, via the hepatopancreatic sphincter and the hepatopancreatic ampulla. We'll look, take a look at the anatomy of that in a second. But do notice also that there is a secondary duct to the pancreas as well, what is known as the accessory duct that also is able to release into the uh, small intestine without having to release that valve or having to release the bile and components like that from it as well. So we have a main and an accessory duct to that. And that's what these alveoli connect to. So they produce a secretion that is released outside of the body. And here's another nice pretty picture of that as well. Here we have a nice illustration of the histology of this, where again, they're emphasizing that these acini connect to ducts and express outside, whereas our pancreatic islets are, be, are with the alpha and the beta cells are able to produce hormones, release them to the interstitial fluid, release them to the blood supply, and carry throughout the body that way. What I also want to take a closer look at is this structure where it that primary pancreatic duct enters into the duodenum. Basically, what we have is two ducts that come together. So as you can see, we have that main pancreatic duct of the pancreas and the common bile duct that comes from the gallbladder and the liver. And guess what the common bile duct carries? Bile. Bile, there you go, excellent. Whereas the pancreatic duct carries the pancreatic juice. They come together into a large opening. This large opening is called the duodenal ampulla and it expresses out a large finger-like extension known as the duodenal papillae, this finger-like extension that sticks out into the duodenum, the small intestine. And notice also there is an enlargement of the circular layer of the smooth muscle here that helps to form a valve that controls the release of both our pancreatic juice and our bile. It is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter because it controls both hepato being a liver, pancreatic involving the pancreas. Uh, an ampulla is an open space. So this open space inside of here uh, is the ampulla. And then the ampulla expresses its secretion out the papilla, out the opening of the papilla. So I would say the ampulla isn't so much the opening as the open space inside of the papilla. Does it, uh, the sphincter control, controls them at the same time or is yep. it a good It controls them at the same time. And anyone remember from the last lecture, which hormone controls this valve? I'll wait while you figure it out because it makes a great lab exam question. 
I show you this picture. Gastrin's not a bad guess, but no, it wasn't gastrin. Gastrin does do a lot of things, but not the gastrin. Well, remember we talked about how the hormone release from our small intestine is really based on the composition. And if one of the goals is going to be to release bile into the small intestine, what would cause us to want to release bile? The presence of what in our small intestine? Uh, lipids. Lipids, absolutely. Bingo, Eric's got it. Cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is released in the presence of lipids. And one of its functions is to relax that uh, hepatopancreatic sphincter and also cause the liver and the gallbladder to release its contents, the pancreas to release its contents. So yeah, cholecystokinin is a very important hormone in helping us to control the function and digestion of lipids. All righty. Questions on that anatomy? Um, is the hepatopancreatic um, ampule the same thing as the duodenal ampule? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah they're both the, the space formed after this valve, yes. So they're interchangeable? Yes. Okay. Although duodenal papillae is not. I don't think I've ever heard that called hepatopancreatic papillae. So the papillae is just the duodenal papillae, but I have heard the ampulla both ways. Okay. Again, fun with anatomy. All right. I had a question. Um, yes. So the common bile duct, that comes from the liver, right? And it yep. goes through the well, pancreas? It, uh, it, uh, no, uh, it comes by the pancreas. I wouldn't say that it necessarily penetrates through the pancreas, although I guess it has to kind of maybe a little bit, but it, 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 it is adjacent to the pancreas. Let's say it that way. Okay. And the pancreas, the only thing it secretes into the small intestine is the pancreatic juice? Correct. Although you say only, like that's not a big deal. And let's actually talk about what it is that's in that pancreatic juice because it's some pretty darn important stuff. Okay. Yep. So let's do that right now. So again, depends on how frequently you eat, the volume of food you eat, the composition of your food you eat. That can cause all these things to vary. But in general, we produce about a liter and a half of pancreatic juice during the course of a day. Pancreatic juice basically has two primary components to it, right? It contains enzymes, water, ions, things along those lines. But it also contains a lot of bicarbonate and phosphate buffers. In fact, pancreatic uh, juice is fairly alkaline with a pH of about 7.5 to 8.8. .8. Why might it be important to have it be alkaline, to have it contain bicarbonate and phosphate, these very important buffers? What do buffers help us do? Yeah, well, res true, resist pH changes, they, they help to stabilize the pH, absolutely. In this case, though, what we need them to do is to help us to neutralize the acidity and bring it back up to a comfortable pH, absolutely. All right, remember, what's happening is that chyme is being presented to the small intestine. That stomach has that thick, sticky, alkaline uh, mucus lining the inner cavity of it, providing that protection. But it also keeps the food away from the wall of the stomach. Remember, the stomach only has very limited absorption abilities. That's because the food doesn't come close to this wall because of that thick protective mucus layer. We want the food in contact with the small intestine wall because we want to be able to absorb those nutrients. We wanna be able to use those brush border enzymes. We wanna be able to do all those things. And so we need to get rid of that acidity, neutralize that acidity so that the chyme doesn't damage the small intestine. Remember, it's one of the reasons why the stomach only gives about three milliliters of food to the uh, chyme to the small intestine with each contraction. That way it's a very small amount that's easier to neutralize and then again allows us to process it uh, fully and completely. And 
Again, this is gonna be regulated. The production of pancreatic juice is regulated by the nervous system, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Obviously parasympathetic increases function, increases secretion, sympathetic decreases it. And again, this occurs during this phallic phase when you're thinking about food or tasting food or looking at food or smelling about food. But as we also mentioned, cholecystokinin plays an important role in helping to produce and release those enzymes as well. Secretin also can play a role here, but it's more about releasing those buffers. If you remember, secretin is a hormone that helps us to balance the pH more. So it emphasizes production and release of the bicarbonate and the phosphates, whereas cholecystokinin is more uh, the enzymes, the water and the ions that are gonna help to break down the food. <clears throat> Chemical digestion is using enzymes to break bonds to break large, complex macromolecules down into those basic building blocks, all right? So we need a large number of specialized ions to help us to do this. Some of the ions produced by the pancreas are trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase. Any idea what this helps us to break down? Excellent, okay, peptides. So let's be more specific, proteins, right? Uh, into small peptides and even further broken down into amino acids. Excellent, those are the basic building blocks that we want, absolutely. So we have trypsin, which is the most common uh, protein enzyme produced by the pancreas, breaks down proteins into small pep peptides and amino acids. Sneak that up there. Good news is it gets a little easier from here. What do you think pancreatic amylase helps us to break down? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. Into what? What do carbohydrates get broken down into? There you go, monosaccharides and disaccharides. Oops. Hold on. Saccharides, or again, what we call simple sugars. Um, no, no. Oh, great question. So yes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase are all enzymes that break down proteins into amino acids. They all happen to break them at different locations, big different peptide bonds. Uh, probably carboxypeptidase is probably the most fun one. Basically, it finds the amino acid at the end of the strand and breaks it off. It doesn't care what it is. It doesn't care, you know, what uh, amino acid it is, what amino acid it's bound to or anything else. It just finds the end of the string and breaks one off. And it just works its way up the string of amino acids that way. So yeah, all of these have different binding sites, different, uh, slightly different functionalities to them. But all three of them are involved in breaking down, Ooh. Excuse me, breaking down amino acids. No, breaking down, yeah, breaking down proteins into amino acids. All right, pancreatic amylases break down carbohydrates. What do you think pancreatic lipases do? Break down lipids. Yeah, break down lipids into, what are the building blocks of lipids again? Fatty acids. Okay, excellent, into fatty acids. And what's the other component? Glycerol or other alcohols. Alcohols, glycerol is definitely one of the most common because again, triglycerides are the most common as well. Oops, out of control. 
uh, like glycerols, but uh, other alcohols as well. So let's go back for a second. We've been talking about this protein chemical breakdown is completed here in the small intestine, but where did it start again? Where did our breakdown of proteins begin? Stomach. Stomach, uh -huh. excellent. Where did our breakdown of carbohydrates begin? Mouth. Mouth, excellent. Where did our breakdown of lipids begin? Stomach. Stomach, excellent. Perfect. What started the breakdown of proteins in the stomach? Lipsin. Well, oh. What was the hormone? Pepsin. Uh, the enzyme, oh, there, pepsin. Uh, what's the uh, enzyme in the mouth that started the breakdown of carbohydrates? Salivary amylase. Salivary amylase. What was the enzyme that started the breakdown of lipids in the stomach? Pancreatic lipase. What was it? My volume, mm -hmm. I think, is down. Go ahead. Lingual lipase. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. Right? Are we missing a macromolecule? Nucleic acid. There you go. And lo and behold, guess what enzymes the pancreas produces? Ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease. What do you think those break down? They break down DNA and RNA. So that breakdown of DNA and RNA actually starts and finishes here in our, uh, in our small intestine. And again, we're breaking DNA and RNA, thank you uh, for reminding me, Alex, uh, into nucleic acids. And Alexa, you got it too, uh, nucleic acids. All right, those are the building blocks, perfect. So there you go. And obviously this starts in the small intestine and ends in the small intestine, All right? So we're learning our mystical magical journeys are slightly different for each of our macromolecules. So no, because obviously pancreatic amylase isn't present in the oral cavity. It's just released into the small intestine. So remember it was the, uh, it was the uh, salivary amylase that started the breakdown of the carbohydrates in the mouth. All right, now remember pepsin was an enzyme that was released in an inactive state because again, things like lipids and carbohydrates and proteins and nucleic acids are things that cells have inside of them. And so they don't want active forms of these enzymes inside of them. So what happens is they're released into the small intestine and it is typically, as I mentioned before, those brush border enzymes. Actually, let me write that before we look at the pretty picture. Brush border enzymes that activate many of these enzymes. Remember, as we talked about, those microvilli have all these special enzymes that are bound to their plasma membrane on the outside of our plasma membrane. And they play an important role in actually completing the digestion of many of these macromolecules, as well as the activation of our enzymes. Now, I'm not gonna hold you responsible for all of these names. I just want you to see the picture. So notice, for instance, uh, trypsin is produced in an inactive form called trypsinogen, and it is that membrane-bound enzyme. Where's my highlighter? There it is. Membrane-bound enzyme here in, on our brush border that activates it into its active form. Of course, trypsin breaks down protein, so it can activate uh, more trypsinogen, as well as activating our other inactive enzymes as well. So they get it broken down by the membrane bound enzymes as well as activated by trypsin itself. So again, again, you don't have to memorize these terms. The point I just want you to know and remember is that these things are typically released in an inactive state and are not activated until they reach the small intestine.
Yeah, so that is correct. Salivary amylase in the mouth, pancreatic amylase in the small intestine, the duodenum, and uh, no chemical digestion of uh, carbohydrates in the stomach. All right, excellent. So questions on the pancreas and what it does. All right, excellent. Let's switch gears to our liver then, talking about the gross anatomy of the liver first. As I mentioned, the liver is the largest visceral organ in adults. It is comprised of four unequal lobes. So again, it takes up the majority of the upper right quadrant of your abdominal pelvic cavity and is comprised of four unequal lobes. By far the largest of all the lobes is the right lobe, which is this structure that you see here. Second largest is the left lobe. And both of these, notice we are looking at this from an anterior view. Now you will notice that there is Great question. Uh, the gallbladder itself is not necessarily green in color. What happens is the gallbladder, especially when filled, is relatively thin in its membrane. And so you can actually see the bile inside of it, which is very, very green. So it is more green in this case. Uh, uh, and again, this is uh, uh, um, Drained would be my guess, which is why we're just seeing the membrane of it instead of it filled with bile. What I do want you to see is there is this nice thick connective tissue structure that divides the right and the left lobe. It is what is known as the falciform ligament. At the inferior portion of the liver, that falciform ligament continues out beyond the liver forming a structure known as the ligamentum teres or also the round ligament. At least it is in babies and grown-ups and adults. Anyone know what this round ligament is in utero? What is the uh, ligamentum teres? Yeah, what is it there? What is it used for exactly? Umbilical cord's probably not a bad guess. That's probably a good way to describe it, right? Again, if you think about it, baby's not able to eat, baby's not able to drink, but it still has that liver, that magic box that needs to be able to regulate the food and stuff that's coming in. And baby gets that stuff from mom via the umbilical cord that umbilical cord passes through the abdominal pelvic cavity. When you are born, right, we bite or cut or do whatever to that umbilical cord and it shrivels up and becomes the belly button on the outside. But those blood vessels that led from, those arteries and veins that led from the umbilical cord to the liver shrivel up on the inside as well and become the ligamentum teres. So yeah, the ligamentum teres is basically the vestigial uh, umbilical cord. After the umbilical cord is cut, no more blood throws through those and they shrivel up and become this kind of extension of connective tissue off the inferior portion of the liver. If we flip this around and look at a posterior view, we see a couple important characteristics. Uh, the first I want you to emphasize is this big, huge indentation. This big, huge indentation on the posterior part of the liver is where it actually wraps around the inferior vena cava. So it actually wraps around the inferior vena cava and the hepatic veins that come out of it feed right into the inferior vena cava. All right, so we see that nice indentation very, very clearly, or what is known as the sulcus 
for the inferior vena cava. But we can also see the two much, uh, my guess is probably just uh, dark from the blood vessels that were the, the blood that's in this region. That's probably why it's dark in color. The other thing we can see are the two posterior, much, much smaller lobes. And that is the caudate lobe located up here, adjacent to the inferior vena cava. And the quadrate lobe right here, adjacent to the uh, ligamentum teres and the gallbladder that we see there. And if you have trouble remembering which is which, just remember they're in alphabetical order. We have our caudate first and then our quadrate uh, for those two lobes. So four total lobes, all very asymmetrical. And notice also, as someone pointed out, we see that gallbladder uh, associated with the liver, but not actually a part of the liver. Nope, the lobes don't have different functions. Why it is segmented so asymmetrically, I don't have a good answer for you, but all the lobes basically do the exact same thing. There's actually a tremendous amount of precision to the microscopic anatomy of the liver, which is really, really cool. All right, so like I said, uh, if one fails, do all parts fail? That is a great question. Um, so many of the organs that are compartmentalized, like the, the lungs are probably the best example I can think of. The lungs have lobes uh, and they have lobules inside of those. And those lobules are compartmentalized both with the nervous system that goes to them, the blood vessels that go to them and the airways that go to them. The liver isn't compartmentalized in that same way. So even though we have anatomically four lobes, I don't think that histologically they're so distinct that um, that damage would be compartmentalized that way. So I think typically when someone has uh, liver problems, it's because the entire liver is failing. And that's one of the problems is that as the liver is degenerating and becoming less functional, right? Uh, it's still able to do some of the job. And so you're typically not aware of it until it's uh, failed so much that someone's getting jaundice or having pain or other problems that way where it probably, um, so yeah, it doesn't, it functionally it's not compartmentalized the same way. So when it fails, it's all of it failing. I don't, I don't think I've heard of just an individual lobe failing of the lung, of the liver. It's a great question. You are correct. The liver can indeed regenerate. It is relatively slow. Uh, and again, that is true. So if you've damaged your liver, uh, it can take a really long time. On average, a uh, liver cell divides once every eight months to eight to 12 months. So like once a year, basically the liver cells divide. So yes, it can regenerate, but it regenerates very, very slowly, typically not fast enough for you to compensate for the liver failure. Uh, so what you can do is get a liver transplant. And what they do now is they typically do not uh, transplant the entire liver. You get a portion of someone's liver, you get half of their liver and they get or a third of their liver. And in time, in many, many years, that liver will eventually expand to become a full-size liver. And the person who gave you a lobe of the liver it will expand and grow back as well. So yes, it does regenerate, but it is a relatively slow process. Yeah, and so yes, yeah, so just one small part. Like again, if it wasn't from you know drinking alcohol, but you know you got uh, uh... great question. Uh, so if but if you had a mechanical or physical injury to a lobe, then yeah, it may be possible that the rest can compensate while that part heals. Dialysis is more about filtering the toxins out of the blood, so more about compensating for what the kidneys do as opposed to what the liver does. All righty. So that is our gross anatomy. Again, it's the largest visceral organ. Uh, and like I said, it is very uniform in its microscopic anatomy. 
the liver is divided into over half a million individual hexagon shaped liver lobules. And these liver lobules are vital for the function uh, and they, they form the structural units of the liver. Obviously the liver cells are the hepatocytes and they are superstars in the digestive system. The things that those hepatocytes do uh, is truly, truly amazing. They help us to regulate the nutrient levels in our blood. They help to detoxify the blood. And in their spare time, they produce bile. Like taking care of your blood wasn't enough. They help in digestion by producing bile as well. Now, if you remember also way back, way, way, way back in ancient times when we were talking about our immune response, we mentioned Kufr cells that were found in the liver. Remember, these are phagocytes that uh, are anchored in the liver and play an important role as antigen presenting cells. So as some of the blood coming back to the liver from our digestive system can be monitored for anything harmful. And if there's something harmful in there, those Kufr cells will phagocytize it, break it down and express its antigens on the surface to activate the immune cells in our blood. And so we'll see where those are located and how they uh, serve that important function. Obviously, the liver is able to regulate our nutrient levels because uh, it is able to store excess of things that are taken in from what we ingest. But also, if there's anything lacking, it is able to give those off as well. So the liver stores a large amount of lipids, a large amount of heavy metals, a large amount of iron. And again, that's one of the reasons why it has that dark, dark, deep red coloration when you ever go to the store and buy a beef liver, for instance, or look at a beef liver, that dark colors because the heavy metals and the iron that is in it. All right. Let's take a look at one of these liver lobules. Here we have this great illustration from your textbook that does a really spectacular job of showing this. What we have here, as you can see, are these individual rows of hepatocytes. So we have rows of hepatocytes that start from the outer edge of the hexagon and move in towards the center of the hexagon, of the hexagon, radiating around a central structure. And that central structure is the central vein. In fact, let's actually do our own drawing of this. All right, so here we have this hexagon shaped structure. And as I mentioned at the center of that hexagon is a large blood vessel called the central vein. The hepatocytes, which we'll make brown because it amuses me to do so. Form these rows of cells that radiate towards the center of our hexagon. And like I said, while they have literally hundreds of jobs that they do do, there are basically two primary functions. Those two primary functions are to process the blood and make bile. To process the blood, we need to have blood to be able to process. That blood comes from two sources. So we need two sources of blood bringing blood to our lobule. 
The first blood we need is from the hepatic portal vein. Now, what do you know about the hepatic portal vein? When, when return go through it, I mean, for abdominal cavity. Yeah, there you go, exactly. Basically, the hepatic portal vein is what collects the blood from the digestive system. All right. So what do you think the condition of that blood is? Full of nutrients. Yeah, very nutrient rich. Absolutely, it is gonna be very nutrient rich. It's gonna be chock filled with nutrients from all that food that you've been ingesting, right? Or that's being processed by your small intestine. However, while we haven't talked about the absorption rate, and I think I heard someone say this, getting those nutrients out of the uh, lumen of the small intestine and into the, the blood is gonna be an active process, meaning that our small intestine is gonna need ATP meaning that it's gonna need oxygen. So this blood coming to the liver is gonna be nutrient rich and oxygen poor. So we're gonna have these blood vessels and let's make them a light blue. These light blue blood vessels that are gonna be located at the corners of our lobule in the connective tissue septum. There is this, uh, let's use black, but let's use highlighter. There's this connective tissue septum that divides the lobules and separates them from each other. And within that uh, connective tissue uh, septum, there are these hepatic portal veins. And so we'll just write hepatic portal vein as a reminder in one of these. And its job is to bring that nutrient rich blood from the digestive system. However, for these hepatocytes, to do their job, they are going to require a tremendous amount of energy as well tremendous amount of ATP. And if these hepatocytes are gonna make ATP, they need some oxygen rich blood. How might we be able to get some oxygen rich blood to these hepatocytes? Hepatic artery. There you go. The hepatic artery, as we know, is a systemic artery. What does it branch off of? Where does the hepatic artery come from? The celiac trunk. Excellent, right? It goes from the celiac trunk to the common hepatic artery to the hepatic artery to the liver, absolutely. So it comes off of that celiac trunk. And it carries oxygen rich blood. And so here at those corners as well, we have these branches of the hepatic artery. And again, we'll just label one of them, bringing oxygen rich blood. So notice we have two blood vessels here, bringing blood, our hepatic, uh, pardon me, yes, our um, hepatic portal vein is bringing nutrient rich blood. Our hepatic artery is bringing oxygen rich blood and they feed them. So both feed blood into our capillaries because after all capillaries is where the exchange of material is going to take place. 
However, here in the liver, we need a lot of things to be able to get in and out. Sure, we need nutrients to be able to get in and out. But remember, the liver is going to be one of those places where we might want to recycle some of the dead and damaged red blood cells and get them out. We may we only get large glycogen molecules or lipids and things like that in. If only there was a big, loose capillary with lots of extra space and an incomplete epithelium to it that might make it easy to be able to get materials in and out. Does something like that exist? There you go. So both the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic artery feed blood into sinusoid oops, capillaries. And those sinusoid capillaries, and we'll do this in purple, basically run in between the hepatocytes. So these blood vessels feed into all these capillaries, these sinusoid capillaries that are between the hepatocytes and all these sinusoid capillaries then feed the blood into the central vein. Now here in the sinusoid capillaries, and we'll make them orange, in the sinusoid capillaries is going to be where you would find those Kufer cells we talked about. Oops. Are gonna be located inside of those sinusoid capillaries. Their job is, as we talked about, to act as phagocytes, present those antigens, but they also play an important role in storing uh, some of our heavy metals. Oops, that should not be open. Let's go ahead and close that. Um, storing heavy metals in here. Uh, one of the things we talked about, remember when there's a fever, that fever triggers the absorption and storage of some of those heavy metals that help uh, uh, viruses to reproduce. Well, these Kufr cells play a role in helping to store those and hide those away from the viruses as well. And so they're gonna feed their um, blood into those sinusoid capillaries, and then those sinusoid capillaries are gonna feed it into that central vein. And once it feeds it into the central vein, then it's been processed. So in the central vein, the oxygen has been used. So once again, our blood is oxygen poor. Um, that oxygen poor blood though now is nutrient appropriate. All right, so what this means is that, again, I know this is an, un, uh, uh, you know, an unusual concept for those people in this class because I know everybody in here has perfectly balanced meals for every single meal where you have absolutely the right amount of macro and micronutrients to make sure the uh, optimal health for your body. But as we've talked about before, some people may have a Diet Coke and a donut for breakfast, right? So they may have plenty of excess glucose, right? Or things along those lines, but they may not necessarily have all the magnesium that they need. So the key with these hepatocytes is these hepatocytes both release contents uh, that are needed as well as absorbing contents that are excessive so that when the blood enters the central vein, it is oxygen poor, but now it is nutrient appropriate. And that central vein feeds out of the liver out via what blood vessel? What blood vessel do you think these central veins feed into? Hepatic vein. Hepatic vein. And that hepatic vein feeds into what? Inferior venous cava. Excellent, which of course carries it back to the heart. And then that heart carries that nutrient appropriate blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. And now we have nutrient appropriate, uh, highly oxygenated blood that can be distributed throughout the body. Excuse me? Yes. Can I ask you to, to make your writings a little bit bigger? Sorry, I've been making it small because I wanted to fit it in these spaces here. 
I mean, those on the side. Yeah, I know. I guess I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't think it, I don't think after the fact, I don't think I can change them anymore. Okay. Maybe. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. See, I can't once, unfortunately, once I've, once I've stopped writing them, I can't modify them. So I do okay. apologize for that. Okay. But we're going to go through all of this again with the lecture. So you'll see it there as well. All of that sounds awesome, amazing, super duper important. But as we also mentioned, these hepatocytes are overachievers because while they have this day job where they work 16 hours a day, eh, heck, hepatocyte works 24 hours a day, but in its free time, it likes to make bile. So these hepatocytes are going to make bile and when they produce that bile, they need to release that bile into these tiny little miniature canal-shaped tunnels, these little canal-shaped ducts that are gonna collect them. And any idea what we might call a canal-shaped duct or space? Almost like the kind of thing that we had in our bones where our osteocytes had those tiny little canals that contained their processes close. How about a canaliculi? So we have these bile canaliculi. And now I will make that small again. These bile canaliculi that are going to feed into a bile duct. And this bile duct exits the hepatocyte, exits the uh, lobule into a third structure located here in the septum at the corners of our lobules where we have a branch of the bile duct. So notice two things. The first thing I want you to notice is that our blood starts from the outside and comes in towards the center, whereas our bile starts towards the center and comes out to the duct. So we have two different fluids flowing in two different directions through this elaborate structure. And while I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this, let's look at a pretty picture from your textbook and see what it looks like here. Notice here, we see this excellent illustration that does a really, really nice job of showing us that hexagonal shaped uh, liver lobule with the central vein at the center feeding out into the hepatic vein. It receives blood from our hepatic portal vein and our hepatic artery. Hepatic artery is feeding oxygen rich blood into our sinusoid capillaries. Our hepatic portal vein is feeding nutrient rich blood into these and so the two bloods mix in the sinusoid capillaries, which are surrounded by the hepatocytes, which move either things into or out of the blood. Notice, look, they've even put one of our Kufer cells in there. So we can see that Kufer cell hanging out inside that sinusoid capillary. Put another one down there too. So that blood gets processed as it moves from being nutrient rich and oxygen rich to being nutrient appropriate and oxygen poor to then leave the liver. At the same time, notice we have all these bile canaliculi collecting the bile that all these hepatocytes make in their free time. And that drains out into our bile duct. And so notice at the corner, at every corner of this liver lobule, there are three structures. And those three structures are known as the portal triad. A branch of the, I think, a branch of a bile duct, a branch of the hepatic artery, and a branch of the hepatic portal 
then we see it really nicely here. Here's another illustration. I love here how they've removed the sinusoid capillaries here so we can really see the individual hepatocytes. Notice here we see that connective tissue septum that separates the individual lobules. And again, at every intersection, at every corner of these, we have that hepatic portal triad. All right, so again, central vein at the center, hepatocytes radiating around from that center, separated by the sinusoid capillary, capillary with plenty of Kufr cells inside of them. And then we have that branch of the hepatic portal vein bringing nutrient rich blood, branch of the hepatic artery bringing oxygen rich blood and our bile duct collecting the bile that is being produced by the hepatocytes. All right, questions on that? I want you to show, to show you a couple of things. Do, do, do. Hold on. Actually, I'll tell you what. Why don't I set it up and we'll do it after the break. This will be perfect. Let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we will take a 15 minute break. So that means come back at 1.33. And at 1.33, here, let me write that down. And then I'll go grab the stuff that I want to grab. At 1.33, we will pick up the lecture from here. All right, any questions? All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes, 1.33. All righty. So we were working our way through the anatomy of the liver and talking about its functions. And as we mentioned, we have this relationship here with the triad <clears throat> where it has the three main components to it. Uh, two of them being blood vessels, the hepatic artery, which again, brings the oxygen rich blood and the hepatic portal vein, which brings the nutrients. So both of them are bringing together, mixed together through the sinusoid capillary, leaves through the central vein into the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava. Again, materials move in both directions, in and out of the hepatocytes as necessary. And like I said, because the hepatocytes aren't doing enough for you, they also make bile. Now, I mentioned that there were some other things I wanted to show you, and those are on our website. So if you go to our module, in our module, I've added two pictures uh, of some models that I couldn't find in the classroom. So I wanted to be able to find them here to show you. Uh, the first one is uh, here, our liver module, our model, sorry. We'll come back to this picture a little bit later when we talk about the gallbladder and all these ducts and everything. But what I really like about this is that you can see uh, there are actually three different types of blood vessels that we can see here, right? Obviously the, the, the most obvious ones are the red ones. What is this red blood vessel number 13 coming into the liver? Well, let's actually orient ourselves from the liver. This is some kind of weird um, inferior view where we can see uh, where the inferior vena cava is coming down through the posterior side. So posterior is up here, anterior is up here. Uh, we can therefore see that this is that uh, larger right lobe, the smaller left lobe. And here we see the caudate and the quadrate lobe. This here represents the quadrate, remember, between the um, falciform ligament and the um, gallbladder. So we see that. But we see that there are three different blood vessel types. So let's clear all that. Anyone know what blood vessel 13 is? Hepatic artery? Yeah, that's the hepatic artery, absolutely. So the hepatic artery, and again, its job is to bring the oxygen. It is a systemic artery, comes off the celiac trunk, bringing oxygen-rich blood to the liver so that those hepatocytes can make ATP 
to do their work, right? Clearly, as we said, this darker blue blood vessel is the inferior vena cava. And therefore this dark blue blood vessel and these branches of it over here, what must this dark blue blood vessel be? Portal vein. Say again. <clears throat> portal vein. Nope, not the portal vein. This notice is feeding into the inferior vena cava. So what would that be? Hepatic vein, absolutely. <clears throat> what is the condition of the blood in the hepatic vein? Nutrient rich. Well, is it necessarily? Uh, no. It would be oxygen poor and nutrient poor. Well, not necessarily nutrient poor, but nutrient appropriate. Remember the whole reason we go to the liver is to be able to store excess nutrients from the food that came from our digestive system and add ones that we are missing. So it would be uh, more precise to say that at this point it is nutrient appropriate. Right, it has the right amount of nutrients to provide those nutrients for the other cells of our body. All right, but then notice there's this weird white colored, and it's really a very, very light blue, but this particular slide, uh, this particular uh, picture makes it look very white. What would this white blood vessel represent? Yeah, that represents the hepatic portal vein. And what's the condition of its blood? Oxygen poor and nutrient rich. Because remember, the hepatic portal vein is bringing all that blood from the digestive system to the liver to be processed. So you can see as you look around in here, three different types of blood vessels, the branches of the hepatic portal vein, branches of the hepatic artery, and then our hepatic veins, which are collecting and feeding into the inferior vena cava. So we see that really, really nicely. This great model does an excellent job of showing that. The other model picture that I put on here, which is one I absolutely love, and hearing me say that I absolutely love should be an absolute dead giveaway that this is gonna be on the exam. And let's go ahead and fill the screen with this one. This picture is actually this big, huge model in the classroom that probably weighs about 30 pounds. You get to both learn and get a workout when you play with it. And what they've actually done here, and let's actually cheat and go back to the lecture. If we go back in the lecture to, let's say this picture right here, notice they've taken a wedge out of our, um, out of our lobule. Well, that's exactly what this illustration is. This illustration is basically if you, cut sl if you sliced off this piece right here like this, just a slice of this and laid it down on its side, that would be exactly what we would have here. So notice over here on this side, we have a large lone blood vessel all by itself. What might that large lone blood vessel all by itself be? Central vein. Central vein, excellent. That is indeed the central vein. So uh, hepatic portal vein, nutrient rich, oxygen poor, hepatic vein, nutrient appropriate, oxygen poor, and the hepatic artery is nutrient rich and oxygen rich. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a systemic one. So it would be nutrient rich and oxygen rich. Yeah, bringing those nutrients and that oxygen to those hepatocytes so they can do work. Yep. All right, so central vein there, excellent. Notice we have two blood vessels over here, a red one. What would the red blood vessel be? Hepatic artery. Hepatic artery. We have a blue blood vessel over here. What would it be? Not hepatic vein, hepatic portal vein. There you go, hepatic portal vein. Excellent, All right? And which way does blood move on this illustrate on this model from left to right or right to left? Left to right. Left to right, absolutely. It moves in this direction, right? The blood from the um, oxygen-rich blood from the hepatic artery is fed into the sinusoid capillaries. 
the nutrient rich blood from the hepatocortal vein fed into them. Notice they've kind of tried to give us this weird looking uh, incomplete endothelium on these. We can't really see inside. So we're not seeing any of the Kufer cells that would be located. The Kufer cells would be located inside of this space. We're not really seeing them. But one of the things we do see is that the sinusoid capillaries are surrounded by the hepatocytes, uh, where again, uh, nutrients will be either released into the blood or taken out of the blood, depending on what the levels are. If there's too much of something, we're going to store it. If there's not enough of something, we're going to express it in there uh, so that we're able to make the blood nutrient appropriate. And at the same time that is going on, we have bile moving in the opposite direction, being produced by the hepatocytes, filling into the bile canaliculi, the bile canaliculi drain into the green structure, which is a branch of the bile duct. And these three things collectively are known as what? Portal triad. Portal triad, excellent. Of course, there's a fourth structure here. What the heck's that fourth structure? Any idea what this fourth structure might be? No. You know, I love making fun of our of our artists for screwing things up and having a fourth structure is kind of a big screw up, but because of what it is, I'll allow it. Lymphatic vessel is not a bad guess, but nope. What's even more important than that? Nerve. There you go. It's a nerve. It's a nerve. Exactly. So, yeah. So there you go. Beautiful model. It's huge. This thing is huge. A beautiful model. Like I said, it weighs about 30 pounds, but it's a really great example of these things. Shows it really nicely. And the cool thing about the handout that I've given you is there is also a key to it as well. So these are pictures I stole from one of the other instructors uh, that has a key associated with it. And then this nice picture. And again, anything I like this much, you have to figure is going to be on the exam. I, because artists are not always anatomists, that is why. I have a question. I have an answer. Uh, so are we kind of just saying that hepatocytes are like the regulators of nutrients? That is one of their many functions, yes. And they make bile as well? Yep. Okay. Um, yep, so uh, many, many functions, and we'll actually get ready to talk about that in a second. Okay. All right, so we did that, 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 we did that. Excellent. So we've looked at all the pretty pictures, but while we're here talking about it, I want to actually do some histology as well. So let's just do that. Um, here, we see the individual lobules in an actual uh, histology slide. So we can see those nice, obvious central veins that are located here. Here we can actually see the structures that are the portal structures located in the septums that are dividing these lobules up into their individual uh, hexagonal shaped structures. So we can see that here. If we look a little bit closer, I really like this picture because it does a nice job of showing how those hepatocytes are really arranged in rows or what are called cords uh, uh, forming those. And then you can really see the spaces in between where those sinusoid capillaries would be. Now this particular illustration shows where the portal area would be, but it doesn't show the blood vessels in here. Notice if we go back here, we can see the things and they actually can be identified even at a low magnification like this, but let's make it as easy as possible, right? So when we're gonna start off basic, here are the three structures found in a portal triad. And conveniently enough, this picture has them labeled one, two, and three. What do you think structure one is? Portal vein. Uh, hepatic portal vein. Don't just say portal vein on the exam. If you just say portal vein, you won't get, you'll only get partial credit. What makes you say that is the hepatic portal vein? Because it's the largest. 
Yeah, again, one of the things we know about veins is that they have a very, very large lumen. Excellent, all right. What does that make two? Hepatic artery, excellent. Obviously it has a smaller lumen, but how else can you tell that that is the hepatic artery? Smooth muscle around it. Exactly, arteries have a thicker muscularis, tunica muscularis to it. And we see a much thicker muscular wall to this. Still notice both of these are lined with simple squamous epithelial tissues, that endothelium that is part of the tunica and tima, but this one has a much larger muscularis to it. So that's clearly the artery while this one is clearly the vein. And then notice three here, instead of being lined with a simple squamous epithelial tissue is formed by a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue rolled up. And so that simple cuboidal epithelial tissue rolled up clearly tells you it is what? The hepatocytes? No, nope, not the hepatocytes. The bile duct? The bile duct, absolutely. So notice as intimidating as it may seem, it is actually incredibly easy to distinguish histologically the three portal triad structures. In fact, if we go back to that low magnification view, notice it's very easy to see the vein because the veins have a massive lumen to them, right? We can see if, and if I clear that. Notice this structure here has a thicker wall to it. So that is clearly a duct. Ooh, here's a really good duct that we can see up there. Because again, they're going to have those simple cuboidal tubes to them that can be seen even at a lower magnification. And, and then here, uh, this is probably a duct as well. But notice this right next to it is likely to be either uh, an artery. That would be probably the artery. Notice the artery is going to be the trickiest to see at this magnification. But we can clearly see the veins. We can clearly see the ducts. And again, I wouldn't use this magnification, I would use a higher magnification view, but once we have an idea of what we're looking for, we can kind of still make them out uh, even at a low magnification, all right? And then notice obviously, because they've removed the uh, blood vessels in this, we can see the spaces. We can't really see where those tubes are there, but up close, we can see it very clearly. All right, I, have but, question. I have an answer. Can you show again the picture with the bile duct? Oh, yes. And so the bile duct isn't in the center and around just um, cells. I, I just got confused. Okay. Well, remember the canaliculi are what collect it from the hepatocytes and they feed it into the bile duct. So if we, maybe it makes more sense if we look back at that model again. Notice as we look in the model, the bile canaliculi are what surround all of the hepatocytes and they feed it into the bile duct that is located out here as part of the portal triad. So they're also around the bile duct? The canaliculi feed into the bile duct, yes. No, I yeah, understand they feed into, but they're also around it, like uh, around the bile duct, as on, on, the, on the previous picture. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me. And the histology picture? Yes, the number three one. Yes. So in the center, the white, col uh, white color. This? Num number three, number three. Yes. Yeah. It, this is the, the bile duct, right? This is the lumen of the bile duct. Yes, that is correct. What's the cells around it? Again, it is a duct, like the duct of a... Um, salivary gland, right? Or a duct of any type of exocrine gland, ducts need to have a duct, right? Need to be made of a simple cuboidal or simple columnar epithelial tissue that is rolled up into a tube. So you have a place to carry the bile. Remember, this isn't making the bile, this is just transporting it. This is that PVC pipe tube that is forming it. So the cells that wrap around it are not hepatocytes, those are just the simple cuboidal cells that are making up the, uh, the duct, right? This table is made of wood. That duct is made of a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Understand. Thank you. Yep. 
Sorry, I didn't understand what you were asking me at first, but I'm, I'm glad we were able to figure it out. No, that's All it. right. Any other questions on the histology? Blood? Yep, it's not uncommon. They don't drain these things. So it's not uncommon to get some coagulated blood inside of the, see some blood, uh, red blood cells inside of blood vessels. All righty. So the job of the liver, one of its many jobs is to make the bile. Here we've removed the pesky liver, but we can still see what happens to that bile after we've made it. After we make the bile, the job of it is to release it into the small intestine. So all the bile from all four lobes is going to feed into one of two ducts. One is the right and one is the left. I had this one obviously here over here because in anatomical uh, uh, space is the left. This one over here is the right, right? This would be anatomical position. Hepatic ducts. And again, key word here, hepatic ducts, because what does hepatic refer to? Liver. Liver. So all of the bile in the right and left hepatic ducts come from the liver. These two hepatic ducts feed into one singular hepatic duct. So the right and left hepatic ducts feed into the common hepatic duct. Common because it comes from both sides. Hepatic because it's still just the liver. From there, it feeds bile into the bile duct. And the bile duct is what ultimately then expresses that bile into the duodenum. However, is your bile duct constantly releasing bile into your small intestine? No, it's not constantly doing that. It only is doing that when, there, when you're eating fats and those fats need to be processed. So what's gonna happen is that if it's not expressing that bile into the small intestine, then instead what is gonna happen is that bile, instead of going down the bile duct, is going to go up the cystic duct where it can go into the gallbladder. The gallbladder does not make bile. It instead stores and concentrates it. Basically, it stores the bile. And while it's storing the bile, it is drawing water out of the um, bile, concentrating it. In fact, the bile in the gallbladder, the bile in the gallbladder can be as much as 10 times as concentrated and when it, as when it was first produced by the liver. Yes, if the hepatopancreatic sphincter is not open, then instead the bile will go into the gallbladder. However, Remember, when our small intestine releases that cholecystokinin, oops, that cholecystokinin relaxes the hepatopancreatic sphincter, causes the liver to produce and release bile, but it also causes the gallbladder to contract. And as the gallbladder contract, it expresses bile out the cystic duct into the bile duct and out the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So notice this cystic duct is special. Is it in the only duct in the entire uh, bile pathway that the bile can travel in both directions? Every other bile duct is a one-way duct. The cystic duct is the only one that the bile can go up to the gallbladder or it can come out of the gallbladder. What happens when gallbladder is removed? 
Excellent question, right? So you get gallstones or you have some type of injury where the gallbladder gets damaged and it has to be removed. Obviously, we can no longer store and concentrate the bile in the gallbladder, but the right and left hepatic ducts will enlarge. And so the liver is able, because again, remember the liver is what makes the bile and it is able to store some of the bile. So it can store bile and make the bile so that when it's time, it is able to release bile into the small intestine. However, the one thing the liver can't do is concentrate it. So is, it gonna, is the bile that it's gonna release, is it gonna be as potent at emulsifying our fats as it would have been if it was concentrated by the gallbladder? No, maybe not. No, so if you lose your gallbladder, can you still eat ice cream sundaes? Yeah, but you might need to start limiting yourself to one scoop instead of four because your ability to be able to break down those fats is going to be a little bit more limited. Correct. It is either storing or it is releasing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do both at the same time. Excellent. Questions on that? So what happens if, uh, for example, if I don't have it, I mean the, the gallbladder, what happens if I eat too much? I feel, I just feel bad because of the... Uh, well, so if, 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 you, if someone who does not have a gallbladder ingests too much fat, then the risk is that you will not be able to efficiently uh, completely break it down. And if you're not able to efficiently completely break it down, then that lead, can lead to intestinal cramping, uh, discomfort. It can lead to too much uh, fat stain in your digestive system. Uh, so that can uh, lead to, uh, you know, uh, problems with uh, diarrhea or, or you know, uh, um, other types of, you know, a, a, an oily discharge in your fecal a matter of, upon defecation and things along those lines as well uh, from that incomplete breakdown of the lipids. But it's not too harmful for, for the digestive system, right? I mean... Uh, you're not going to die from it, no. Are you going to feel like crap for a couple hours? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's not something that everybody's going to want to do every day, but it's not going to kill you, no. Thank you. All right. All right, excellent. And then again, we kind of already saw now, again, that common bile duct coming down to the main pancreatic duct being released out of that hepatopancreatic sphincter. Excellent. All right, that is both the gross and the microscopic anatomy of the liver. Uh, what we need to do now is talk about its functions and again, we could spend the rest of today and all the next class talking about the functions of the liver. It has over 200 different functions that it is involved in. And the good news is you don't have to memorize all of them, just about 173 of them. No, but the nice thing is all over 200 of these functions basically can be divided up into three general categories that are in some ways related to each other. You're gonna see some similarities between some of these. These three primary function categories of the liver is metabolic regulation, hematological regulation, and bile production. All right, let's again talk in general terms about what some of these things are. Talking first about metabolic regulations. As we talked about, liver's job is to regulate the composition of the blood. Right. What this means is, again, the blood that is coming back from the digestive system has absorbed many, many things. Right. Some of those things are going to be good things. Some of those things are going to be bad things. Some of these things are going to have too much of something or not enough of something. And so it is the liver's job to make it appropriate. If there is too much of something like glucose, we want to absorb that glucose, store it as glycogen. If there's too much magnesium or things along those lines, we want to be able to absorb those and store them for times when we don't have those micronutrients. Right? 
if there are toxins, those toxins could be things like the pesticides that weren't properly washed off the vegetables before you ate them or things along those lines uh, that are in there, right? Or that beautiful char, that carbon that's on the outside of that grilled steak that you had, right? Makes it taste delicious, but there are many toxins in that, car in that, in that carbon uh, from the burning of the meat that might need to be broken down and stored. Uh, it's again, it's definitely a positive thing, but it's one of the always things that I thought that's weird about the fact that people eat livers because your liver, again, while it contains many nutrients, while it contains a tremendous amount of iron, right? Especially if you think about like the cows here, the cows that are, you know, being used for food, right? They're fed all sorts of different types of grains that have all sorts of different types of pesticides and other things on them. And where do those get stored? In their liver. So you're ingesting those toxins as well. So its job is to take excess stuff and store it and then if there's deficiencies, if you don't have enough calcium or if you don't have enough, uh, you know, manganese or things along those lines, it will release it into those, you know, iron, things along those lines as well. All right. This obviously plays an important role in helping us to maintain our blood glucose levels. But it also helps us to maintain appropriate amounts of lipids and amino acids and those other building blocks that we need or that the cells need to do all of their functions. Right? If cells are going to make proteins, if cells are going to make vesicles, if cells are going to divide, they need you know, the nucleic acids, they need the amino acids, they need the simple sugars, they need all of those things. And so it is the liver's job to make sure that those things are in the blood so that every cell in the body is capable of functioning at its optimal level. All right. So this is providing stuff for the cells and helping to inactivate nitrogen waste, toxins, and uh, drugs, right? Medications, things along those lines, right? Recreational drugs, all of those things get broken down by the liver. Now, related to this and similar to this, uh, well, okay. And the liver also plays a role in activating and producing regulatory hormones. Uh, it's the site of activation for um, uh, angiotensin one into angiotensin two. We talked about the liver plays a role in the activation of calcitriol, things along those lines as well. Now, our hematological regulation is similar to this in that there's obviously a massive amount of blood and blood supply going to and from the liver. So the, what, the liver plays an important role of maintaining the condition of the blood. Now again, condition of the blood is kind of related to both of these things, but remember when we're talking about metallurgical re uh, regulation, it's more about making what the cells need nutrient-wise, substance-wise, whereas here it's about making the plasma appropriate, taking care of the blood. Obviously these two things are somewhat related, uh, but they're also slightly different as well. This is where those Kufr cells play a role in helping to activate the immune cells. All that blood and in that plasma could be harmful pathogens, could be complete antigens, things along those lines that need to be addressed and broken down. We need to maintain the osmolarity of our blood. Right, obviously osmolarity is something we're gonna talk a lot about when we get to the urinary system. But remember osmolarity is basically the measure of how much stuff there is in the blood. And you remember one of the most common plasma proteins we talked about way back in 430 was albumin. Albumin is just one of the stuff that is in our blood, one of those plasma proteins that are in our blood. And it's the most common plasma protein, and it is made by our kidney, pardon me, made by our liver. And then, like I said, its job is to remove harmful materials, or it isn't necessarily harmful materials, but remove chemicals. I guess it's probably a good way of describing this, removing components from the plasma. Remember, plasma has our antibodies. Antibodies are very important in immune response, but we don't want them around forever. So they need to get broken down. Same thing with our hormones. Hormones are made and released to serve some function, 
but as they're circulated through the body, they travel through the liver. And as they travel through the liver, those hormones are broken down so that once you make a hormone and release it into the blood, it doesn't stay active forever. This is also what happens with toxins. This is also what happens with drugs, right? In fact, if you think about uh, some of the things for this, this influences many of the factors that determine how much of a dose of a drug you're given and how it is given to you, right? Relative to their size. Obviously, if you're giving medicine to a hummingbird and you're giving medicine to the elephant, the elephant is getting a bigger pill, right? However, relative to their size, who gets the bigger bolus of medicine, the hummingbird or the elephant? The bird. Do they get the same amount? Yes. Alex seems to think it's the hummingbird. It's the same. It is actually the hummingbird. You might think that it's the same, but as it turns out, it is the hummingbird. It is smaller in size. It has a faster circulation. And because it has a faster circulation, the blood travels through the liver more quickly in the hummingbird than it does in the elephant, right? So typically, and it's the same way with kids, typically with kids and adults, right? You, the kids actually get a slightly larger volume compared to the size of them of drugs because it goes through their liver and gets broken down more quickly as a result of that. Same thing with toxins. It affects how you administer it, right? If you have a medication that has a 75% efficiency rate of being broken down by the liver, do you want to take that medicine as a pill? Well, think about it. You take it as a pill. It goes into your blood supply from your small intestine and goes straight to the liver, where the liver is going to break down 75% of that medicine and only 25% get distributed to the rest of your body. Whereas if you take it as an injection, then it continues to circulate and only a small amount of the time gets to go to the liver, right? Cause it's all going to different locations and gets broken down that way. So how efficient your liver is at breaking something down is a big determinant in how often the dose size you get and the method in which you receive that medication. All right, so this is about maintaining the composition of the blood. Our third function, as we mentioned, is bile. Depending on the number of times you eat, the volume of the food you eat, the composition of the food you eat, it can vary dramatically. But on average, we produce about one liter of bile uh, during the course of a 24-hour period of time. And like we said, that gallbladder's job is to store and concentrate it. Now, bile production was regulated by what hormone again? There you go, cholecystokinin. You have to know that's going to be something you're going to have to spell at some point or another, right? Anything with that many consonants in it, you know you're going to have to spell. So what is bile? Bile contains many things, primarily water, some cholesterol, uh, ions, but probably the two most important substances that are found inside of our bile are the bile salts and the bilirubin. Let's talk about bilirubin first because it's more fun. Where does the bilirubin come from? Anybody know? Vitamin D is not a bad guess, but nope. Come on, I know somebody knows. There you go. Not necessarily the iron of the red blood cell, but you got the right idea. It is basically a waste material from the breakdown of hemoglobin. All right? Oops, I'm sorry, I spelled hemoglobin right. Hemoglobin, remember, as we talked about, is basically a pigment. 
where the oxygen binds to the iron and gives the red coloration to our blood. Well, bilirubin is also a pigment that has a yellowish, greenish color, uh, color to it. When that bilirubin in that bile is released into our small intestine, giving that bile its greenish appearance, it is further broken down into two components. One of those components is urobilin. Urobilin is a yellow pigment. And this urobilin is actually reabsorbed by the digestive system. Once it's reabsorbed by the digestive system, it is actually released by the kidneys. In what? What would the kidneys be releasing this urobilin into? Urine, exactly. The yellow coloration from your urine primarily comes from this urobilin from the breakdown of bilirubin in your digestive system. The other thing that bilirubin gets broken down is into something called stercobilin. Stercobilin is a brown pigment. It actually stays in the lumen of the alimentary canal. And if it stays in the lumen of alimentary canal, where does it ultimately end up? In our feces. And the brown pigment and coloration of your feces is primarily from the breakdown of this bilirubin into stercobilin. So both the uh, color of your feces and the color of your urine is in part uh, influenced by the breakdown of this bilirubin, the breakdown of the red blood cells from that bile in the food that you eat. Well, the, in, the, in the bile that you release to break down the food that you eat. So that is bilirubin and what it does. The bile salts, as we also already talked about, oops, I did that, I did that. Oh, I thought I had it, okay. Bile salts job is to emulsify fats. And remind me again what it means to emulsify. Break down physically. Yeah, excellent. It is a mechanical. of a big fat a globule, globule into small fat droplets. Yep, it, basically what happens is, as we know, fats are hydrophobic. They don't like water. So when you have a whole bunch of it together, it basically forms together into a big, huge pool, a big, huge puddle in the center of that water, big, huge globule. And if we have this big, huge globule, it's not easy for the enzymes to get in there and break those fats down. So what bile salts do is they emulsify it. They take that big, single chunk of fat, and break it down into a bunch of small bits of fat droplets. These have a much larger surface to volume ratio. And so it is much easier for them to break down. It's much easier for our enzymes to get in there and chomp up all the little pieces than it is for that enzyme to try to break down that big, huge block, which I'm sure you know because all of you already did the physio X that was due today. And one of those activities involved the breakdown of fats and the use of bile salts to see how that mechanical digestion of emulsifying the fat helps to speed up the chemical breakdown by the enzymes, right? Does that all sound vaguely familiar? Yes. Yeah, I will point out that if we were in the classroom, not only would you have had the physio X exercise that you would have been responsible for, but we would have actually done these activities in the classroom as well.
I would have given you enzymes and bile salts and fat lipids and all these kinds of things that we would have broken down proteins, we've broken down sugars, we would have broken down fats, we would have done all of that stuff in the classroom. So uh, downside is you missed out on it. Upside is, you know, it's super important. So make sure you understand those concepts. All right. Questions on that? I was, I wanted to ask, um, I know this liver, it, it kind of filtrates everything. So when you get pimples on your face or anywhere, I guess, um, it's because they were not broken down by the liver or so? No. So uh, again, if you think about, so, all right, I, I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing because of what it reminded me of. If, I, I, oh gosh, how long ago was that now? I think it was like 10 years ago. If, I don't know if you guys remember, there was, it was a big, huge diet fad for like a weekend. There was this uh, special pill you could take, Olestrol or something like that. Uh, and that would basically, what it would do is it would inhibit the break. Oh no, it's called a lay or something like that. A lay is what the pill was called. And what it would do is it would actually um, denature your uh, lipases, limiting how much lipid breakdown occurred. Then they also made this special non-digestible oil that was called like a lester or something like that. And they used it to make potato chips because what would happen is, is it made the potato chips healthier because you would eat three of those potato chips and normally those potato chips were filled with the fat of frying them. But because they used this special cholesterol uh, oil that was not digestible, the potato chip parts got broken down and absorbed, but the fats weren't. And so those fats weren't fully broken down. And so they, won't where they weren't absorbed into your body or you took that pill, that allay. And I don't think they, uh, they uh, I don't think they manufacture and distribute it anymore. So I don't know, there used to be a website. If you'd ever gone to the website, oh God, it's been such a long time. They didn't call them side effects. They had some other term for what uh, the side effects were, some cutesy term for, uh, uh, for instead of side effects. But one of the things, the recommendations, for instance, was that to be aware that you could have a very explosive gas uh, that could have an oily discharge to it. It wasn't uncommon for when you to go to the bathroom for there to be a big, large pool of oil on there. That was normal. They uh, anal leakage. They encourage you not to wear light colored pants for the first couple of weeks that you were taking it, the pill, because of this type of things that would occur. It was hilarious. Um, no, it wasn't hydroxy cup, but it was this whole other uh, fitness fat. And like I said, and they put these oils in these special oils in the potato chips thinking, oh, that'd be awesome because, you know, people would just eat a handful of them and and they wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, they wouldn't absorb the oil. The problem was people thought, oh, these potato chips are great. You know, I'm not getting any oil. I'll eat a whole bag of them. And so, again, they would have these big, huge oily discharges. And and like I said, it only lasted for a couple of weeks because just the side effects to it were so hideous and horrible. But uh, so, yeah, in those cases, that stays if it's not absorbed, it's going to stay in your digestive system. So it's not going to come out that way. A lot of I know there is um, the belief that a, a, a lipid heavy diet may increase the amount of pimples that are produced as a result of that. But that's typically not the case. The amount of uh, lipids that you ingest aren't necessarily going to be absorbed and expressed in your face. As we talked about, primarily uh, acne is caused by inflammation and infection of the sebaceous glands. And while it is an oily substance, that sebum is not fat. And so it isn't necessarily correlated with that. Hormones, stress, other factors like that, which can also cause people to eat fatty foods, right? For comfort and things along those lines may sometimes be associated with it, but, but one typically doesn't lead to the other. All right. What's cool about these bile salts is they are incredibly efficient. They help to emulsify the fat, make it easier for it to be broken down. And then they're going to actually play a role in the absorption of our lipids back into, not back into, absorption from our digestive system into our hepatic portal veins, which is then going to go straight back to the liver. 
So those bile salts, once reabsorbed, go straight back to the liver where it can then release them again. Again, depending on the size of the meal, the composition of the meal, right? If it's a very large, very lipid dense uh, meal that you have, the same bile salt can actually be recycled as many as five times during the breakdown of that meal. Your book's got this great, great illustration that does a nice job of showing how this occurs. So let's take a look at this and see what's happening. All right. So notice the first thing that happens is that we have the chyme coming in and being presented to the small intestine, right? In this case, it has lipids in it. And because it has lipids in it, remember that is gonna cause cholecystokinin uh, to be released. That's what's represented here in yellow. This yellow then goes into the blood and as it goes into the blood, right, it's gonna go into the hepatic portal vein. And that hepatic portal vein is going to, or maybe it's red, I don't know which one it is. Which one is it supposed to be? It doesn't matter. Oh, it is red, okay, perfect. Uh, red, so the red comes into the hepatic portal vein and comes back to the liver. As it comes back to the liver, it tells the liver to make bile and release bile. Remember, it also tells the gallbladder to contract, releasing bile. And remember, it's going to un, uh, open up that uh, hepatopancreatic sphincter, allowing the bile into the alimentary canal. So bile is released into the alimentary canal. It helps in the emulsification of the fat and binds with the fats as they are broken down. As those fats get broken down, they are absorbed primarily in the ileum of the small intestine into the hepatic uh, portal veins. And again, it travels back, the bile salts travel back via the blood supply back to the liver where they can be recycled again and again and again. So they can keep being continuously used. Now, remember also cholecystokinin stimulates the pancreas to release its enzymes, because remember that bile doesn't do any good by itself. We need those uh, pancreatic lipases to break down those fats to turn them into the fatty acids that can be reabsorbed. So your book does a nice job of describing this, this regulation of the liver and the pancreas uh, by cholecystokinin uh, in relation to those fats. All right, questions on that? Actually, I'm curious. Um, so the process is the food gets into the stomach, which uh, that is going to be turned into chyme into the small intestine, but in order for it to be bile, what kind of ducts does it go into the liver? I'm not sure exactly how it gets into the liver and back into the intestine. Okay, so what happens is that, the, okay, so here, let's do it this way. <clears throat> All right, so here's the small intestine, right? And so what happens is there are some lipids uh, that are present here in the small intestine. And remember, we have those enteroendocrine cells. in the lining of our small intestine that sense those lipids and produce cholecystokinin. And that cholecystokinin enters into the blood supply. All right. Now, as we know, this is happening in the small intestine. So all of the intestinal, uh, all intestinal blood vessels go where first? right, via the hepatic portal vein. Once it gets to the liver, so via the blood,
it goes to the liver and it tells the liver, the cholecystokinin tells the liver and the pancreas, uh, pardon me, and gallbladder to release, well, it tells the liver to make and the liver and gallbladder to release bile. So what's going to happen is our gallbladder and our liver are going to release bile. They do that, as we saw, out the right and left hepatic ducts into the common hepatic duct, into the bile duct, which comes out the papillae into the small intestine. So it is releasing the bile into the small intestine where now that bile that is being released into this mixes with the lipids and it is emulsified. As it is emulsified, it is completely broken down. We will talk about how this happens in just a second. broken down into fatty acids and alcohols. And these fatty acids and alcohols mix with the bile salts. And when they mix with the bile salts, they get reabsorbed, get absorbed into the body. So these alcohols, these bile salts, these fatty acids, cross the membrane into the body. Now, of course, once they get into the body, those bile salts go right back into the blood vessels. Which blood vessels? The hepatic portal vessels. So that means that bile is going to go into the hepatic portal vein, go right back to the liver and bile in the blood stimulates the liver to make more. So it makes more bile, releasing even more bile into the stomach, into the small intestine to make even more uh, fatty acids and alcohols to absorb even more, which then comes back around. And so it's almost like a positive feedback process that it, as there is more lipid inside of our small intestine, we make and release more and more bile to break it down. Then does it go to the lymphatic system? The fats do. The bile salts aren't. What happens with the fats, we'll talk about later. We're going to get to that. Exact, that's exactly the, next, the absolute exact next thing we're going to be talking about. We'll actually talk about that uh, pathway precisely. But in this case, we're just talking about the bile salts. You're right. What happens to the fats is something different. But the bile salts end up right back into the blood vessels and go right back around to the liver and keep the process going. So the food that was digested is different than the bile. So the food doesn't really touch the bile. It's just the basically the bile. The bile, the bile emulsifies the food, breaks it down into small pieces so that the enzymes okay. can chop it up into fatty acids and alcohols. Mm -hmm. Those fatty acids and alcohols then bind with the bile salts. They actually form a structure called a micelle. Whoops. So they actually form a micelle. And that micelle is what actually is absorbed by the body. So the small intestine mm -hmm. absorbs that micelle and that's how the fat, that's how the uh, bile salts get back into the cells, get back into the blood supply and can be recycled around again. So they're helping in the breakdown and the absorption of fats. All right. And like I said, we will talk about that precise pathway in just a bit. Questions on this? 
All right, excellent. Oops, wrong button. So you guys have hit on the key. We have now talked about all the different mechanisms, mechanical and chemical, that we can use to break foods down into their basic building blocks. Once we break them down into their basic building blocks, those basic building blocks need to be absorbed into our body, pass a membrane, right? And to do that, most of it occurs in the small intestine. Now, again, breaking down large complex macromolecules into small ones is the job of enzymes. Again, we've listed all the enzymes. If you need to go back and look at those again, your lab manual and textbook do a nice job of talking about them, but we, let, we talked about them just an hour ago. But remember, as we said, there are also those brush border enzymes on the surface of the small intestine, what we call the enterocytes. And these enterocytes also have a large number of enzymes on their surface that, as we talked about, play a role in activating many of the enzymes that are released from the pancreas, but also they lead to the, so let's, say, let's actually write this down so that we remember it. These enterocytes uh, do basically two functions, two main functions. The first is the activation of the enzymes from their inactive state that they are released from their cells in. But the other thing that these brush border enzymes do is they help to complete the final breakdown of the macromolecules into the most basic building blocks. Right. And again, the most basic building block of a protein is what? Amino acid. Amino acid. The most basic building block of a carbohydrate is? Monosaccharide. Monosaccharide. The most basic building block of a lipid is? Fatty acid. Fatty acid and alcohol. Don't forget the alcohol. So alcohol uh -huh. is important. And the most basic building block of a nucleic acid. DNA and RNA. Well, the DNA and RNA are the nucleic acids, but what do we call the building blocks again? Uh, Made up of one nitrogen base, one phosphate, and one sugar. That was a nucleotide? Yes, yes. Yes. There you go. Excellent. Absolutely. So there you go. So that's our goal, breaking down those large macromolecules into their basic bits. That is the second function. And we just did that. I figured out what the large molecules are and we did this. As I said, the small intestine is the primary site where absorption takes place. 90% of the materials that are absorbed are absorbed in the small intestine. And the majority of that happens at the proximal end. Now we have a simple picture here that shows how this process works. Notice here we have the big large macromolecules like our polysaccharides broken down into intermediate sub, uh, substances like disaccharides and then into monosaccharides, fats into fat droplets, into fatty acids and alcohols, proteins into amino acids, right? And then notice also to cross into the body, we have to pass through those layer of absorptive cells. Well, the duodenum is proximal, but remember it's also only 10 inches long. So it also includes the proximal part of the jejunum as well. So, so the majority happens in the duodenum and the, and, and the proximal part of the jejunum. But the entire small intestine is involved in absorption. Um, so notice we have to cross not one, but two phospholipid bilayers. We need to get past the apical surface of the absorptive cell and the basal surface as well. 
right? This is a concept we're gonna talk about again at a later point, but one of the important things to remember, and here are a couple of these cells and I'll cheat and put the microvilli on this side. So again, this over here is our lumen. This back here would be then our interstitial fluid. Excellent. Now, there are several things we know about this. What, if this is the small intestine, what epithelial tissue is this? Simple. Simple columnar, excellent. Oops, what's going on? Oh, wait, let me just do that. Copy, paste, excellent. Simple columnar epithelial tissue, excellent. Excellent. And like all epithelial tissues, it has an apical surface and it has a basal surface, put that there. Now, one of the things we know about epithelial tissues is they can have a large number of cell junctions. One of those cell junctions might be really useful in making sure that fluid and nutrients aren't sneaking between the cracks and finding their way back in that way. What kind of cell junction would be beneficial for that type of function? Tight junctions, absolutely. Have a large number of globular proteins that are transmembrane proteins that interlock with each other like the teeth of a zipper giving us that tight waterproof junction. These tight junctions limit what can get between the cells. But remember our plasma membrane is a fluid mosaic, meaning, meaning that things move around. And do we necessarily want a transporter that is located on the apical surface to be able to move to the basal surface? Do we just want these channels and transporters to just be able to randomly move themselves around all corners of the cells? No, so the other things that these tight junctions do is that they mechanically separate the apical and basal surfaces so that they're separate from each other. And that is important because we want different, uh, different channels and transporters on uh, both the apical and basal sides. And remind me again, what's the difference between a channel and a transporter? Channels are passive, excellent. Transporters are active. And remind me again, what does that mean to be active? There you go, requires ATP, absolutely. So we are going to have both active and passive transport mechanisms. Things like carriers. Remind me again what a carrier does. Is a carrier active or passive? Carriers are actually passive. Nope, it doesn't depend. Uh, so remember uh, a channel 
for instance, is just a pore. It's a door frame that uh, forms a hole that allows things to move in and out. And again, it doesn't mean that it can't be selective, doesn't mean that it can't be gated and all those types of things, but it is just a hole like a door frame. Remember we talked about like, if you go to the Sacramento Zoo, right back in the old ancient times when you were allowed outside of the house, if you wanna leave the zoo after looking at all the animals, there is a big revolving gate and is the zoo using energy to rotate that gate for you? No. No, if you want out of the zoo, you've got to grab the bar, you've got to push on the bar, you've got to turn that gate so that you can get out. And that's what a carrier does. A carrier has a molecule bind to it and that kinetic energy of the molecule typically changes the shape of it to allow something like a glucose to come in. So we're gonna use channels, we're gonna use carriers, we're gonna use pumps, we're gonna use co-transporters. All right, a co-transporter, remember, allows two things in, something like sodium that really, really wants to come in and allows it to do work for us, right? Like bringing something else in or kicking something else out. If these terms like pump and co-transporter and carrier and channel are things you have forgotten or things you never learned, well, the good news is between now and Thursday, you have plenty of time to go back and reread chapter three on cells where it talks about membrane transport, because you need to know your membrane transport mechanisms when we talk about them, because are there going to be different transport mechanisms on the apical and the basal surfaces? Absolutely. And are you going to need to know what they are and what they do? Absolutely. So what we are going to do on Thursday is we are going to identify all locations Actually, let's do it this way. For our macromolecules for each like that better. Macromolecule. Not sure what's going on there. There we go. We are going to identify all uh, types of mechanical digestion and the locations where they occur. We are going to identify all types of chemical digestion and locations where they occur. Plus the enzyme and what produces the enzyme. Once we've done that down to its basic component, we need to know what its basic component is. Then we have to talk about the absorption. Two-step process. We need to know the mechanism for crossing the apical membrane and the mechanism for crossing the basal membrane. Of course, at that point, our nutrient is gonna be over here in the interstitial fluid. And at that point, we need to know where it goes. What are the two possible structures that could pick up that nutrient here from the interstitial fluid? Excellent. Either a blood capillary 
or a lymphatic capillary. But you are correct. For full credit, we don't want to just remember that it is a um, lymphatic capillary, but we want to identify the specific specialized lymphatic capillary, which is that lacteal. Excellent. And here's the best part. Whether, so we need to know where it goes, which vessel. But here is the best part. We have already talked about the cardiovascular system. We've already talked about the lymphatic system. So what that means is no matter where it goes, either into blood vessel capillary or into lacteal, we can actually trace that nutrient's path to the right atrium. So that we know exactly how it backs gets to the right atrium. Because once it gets to the right atrium, where can that nutrient go then? The rest of the body. Anywhere in the body. Absolutely. So for each macromolecules, and I'll tell you what, I'll even give you nucleic acids. So we'll just do three. We will just do proteins, carbohydrates, and uh, lipids. But those three macromolecules, actually I lied, there's gonna be four essay questions. Uh, those uh, macromolecules, we need to know all of these concepts, all of these processes. And with anything that elaborate, you can be pretty much guaranteed one of these is gonna be an essay question on the exam. So I think that sounds like a good game plan. That is what we're gonna do. All right, questions on that? Everybody get out of the game is played? Stunned silences, that means yes, Dr. Slutsky, I completely understand and I'm ready to rock. Excellent. So let's see how that works. I think we have enough time to do one. So again, here is basically the simplified version of this. Notice we have the breakdown processes, apical and basal uh, uh, transport across the membranes into either a blood vessel or a capillary of the lacteal capillary. And uh, then we know it's going to go back to the heart eventually. So that is the game plan. So as I said, let's talk about an example. We did all of this. We acquire through two membranes. We talked about the types of membrane transports. You need to know all of them. I encourage you to look at them. But I will say primarily we use co-transporters and facilitated diffusion. That is the primary way. So again, if none of that sounds familiar, make sure you're reviewing your mechanisms in chapter three. And then where does it go once it reaches the interstitial fluid? So let's do this. Let's start first, do one example of this, and we will do carbohydrates. Excellent. So let's start easy. Carbohydrates, we want to break down into what? Monosaccharides. Excellent. I'm going to break it down into monosaccharides, right? Perfect. And those monosaccharides are what we are going to want to absorb. Now, to break it down, we have to break it down both mechanically and we need to break down chemically. Now, again, this doesn't have to be how you organize yours for the essay, but this works for me. So, List off the ways and the places that we mechanically break down carbohydrates. Y'all act like you've never broken down before. There you go. Someone's got one. Step one, mastication. And where does that mastication take place? 
in the mouth. Spectacular. Where else do we mechanically break down carbohydrates? Churning. Oops. In stomach. Excellent. Anywhere else? There we go. Beautiful. Segmentation in the small intestine. Beautiful. Any others? I can't think of any. It seems good. All right. But remember, mechanically breaking down is only part of it. We want to chemically break down our carbohydrates. Where did we say that began? Oh. Excellent. With what enzyme? Okay, amylase. Perfect. Anywhere else? Yeah, duodenum. Excellent. Although remember, duodenum is really small. Duodenum is where the pancreas releases its enzymes, but it will be in the entire small intestine. So I certainly wouldn't mark you wrong if you just said duodenum on the exam, but it is okay to just say small intestine. Excellent. With what enzyme? Pancreatic amylase. Ah, which reminds me of two other things. That salivary amylase, where is it made? Salivary glands. And of course, where is our pancreatic amylase made? Pancreas. I assume those are pretty straightforward based on their names, but still doesn't hurt to say that. So in the mouth with the salivary amylase, in the small intestine with the pancreatic amylase, but remember also in our small intestine, uh, we are going to have those brush border enzymes. And again, I said, you didn't have to know the names of the individual brush border enzymes. You just need to know that there are those brush border enzymes, which remember, as we talked about, are going to help to complete the chemical breakdown process. So, and obviously you won't be able to do this on the exam, but I can cheat and do it here. I don't want it to be green. I can have myself. And again, I can have that apical surface. So we'll put the microvilli on the top just so we can distinguish them. But what we need to do is we need to be able to first cross that apical membrane. We need to be able to get across this apical membrane. So now that we have our monosaccharides to cross the apical surface, what type of transporters might be useful for getting across this apical surface? Well, do we think it's going to be most so? Yeah, some types of transporter, absolutely. Do you think we're going to want uh, we're going to want to use active, or we're going to want to use passive, or we're going to want to use both? How important is it that your body get glucose? Very important. Very important. So, absolutely, we're going to want to use active transport to be able to do that. It is primarily going to be co-transporters. Can someone remind me again what a co-transporter is? Two things move, absolutely, right? So obviously we want to get glucose inside.
So we have this glucose that we want to get inside of the cell. So how does that co-transporter do it? Excellent, sodium, absolutely. If you remember from 430, and if you don't, go back to chapter three. Sodium really, 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 really wants into cells. So what these co-transporters do is say, okay, sodium, you can come in, but I'm gonna use the energy of you coming in to do work for me. So sodium, you can come in, but when you come in, you gotta bring a glucose with you, all right? That's what a co-transporter is. Now, is this co-transporter, I said it was active transport, but I don't see any ATP on my drawing here. Is this co-transporter directly using ATP? No, remember this is a secondary active transporter. That indirectly uses ATP. So what happens is sodium comes in, but this only works if sodium wants to come in. So as soon as sodium comes in, what do we have to do? Kick it out. We gotta kick it out, exactly. So what we do is we use something like the sodium potassium ATPase or some other type of sodium pump. And that sodium pump uses ATP to kick sodium out of the cell. So as soon as sodium comes in, we kick it right back out. And that way it can keep you doing work of bringing that glucose or whatever else we need into the cell. So we use a lot of ATP. However, we don't have to rely solely on ATP. We can also have some of those carriers Uh, that are going to allow, so hold on, passive transport with some carriers that, again, the glucose changes the shape of the carrier, but no ATP is used to get into the cell. So boom, these both get glucose into the cell. Now, remember, this up here is the lumen. If the glucose stays in the lumen, what happens to it? It's not a trick question. If a glucose molecule stays in the lumen of the small intestine, what happens to that glucose molecule? It becomes a waste. Yeah, it leaves with the poop. It becomes waste, absolutely. So notice it makes sense to use energy. We wanna use energy to make sure we are getting that glucose out of the lumen. Now, luckily we have a very glucose rich diet. So we can also rely on passive as well. So notice we are here using both active and passive transport active because it's vital that we get the glucose, but uh, there's so much glucose in our diet, we can rely on passive transport as well. Now, once the, the glucose is in the cell, are we gonna lose it? Is it gonna become poop once it's inside of the cell? No, we've saved it now. It's not gonna become poop, so we've saved it, it's in it. Now, do we have to modify or do it, anything to it inside the cell? No, that'd be silly. But what we do need to do is get it out the basal surface. We need to get this glucose out the basal surface. Oops, that's not what I was supposed to do. I wanted that. So we need to get our glucose out. Out the basal surface. So if we are going to cross the basal surface,
All right? So both active and passive. And remember this, uh, these carriers are what we call facilitated diffusion. Right, it's diffusion. We're not using ATP, but we are using a molecule that lets it pass through the plasma membrane. So it's a facilitated diffusion via that carrier. Let's put that there. Now, ATP is important. ATP is hard to make. ATP is vital for the function of a cell. Now that we have this glucose in the cell, do we need to really bother wasting ATP to get the glucose out of the cell across the basal surface? It was important to use it up here because if we didn't use the ATP here, that glucose was lost. But now the glucose isn't gonna be lost anymore. Exactly, so now that we have it in the cell, we don't have to, to worry about it anymore. There's no sense in using ATP anymore. So to cross the basal surface, we're just gonna use that passive transport that facilitated diffusion with carriers. So we're just going to use those carriers to get across the basal surface. And once it's across the basal surface, it is now in the interstitial fluid. I'm a little confused about the um, active transport way. Yes. So when the sodium pump pumps out the sodium to the basal uh, surface, mm -hmm. is it taking the glucose with it or is the glucose staying? No, separate. Remember here on the apical surface, it's not like the, it's not like the, here's what I'll, it's not like the sodium and the glucose are holding hands together. The, 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 the analogy that I always use in 430 is, as we know, things like to move down a concentration gradient, okay? So if I'm standing at the top of a hill with a ball and I let that ball go, that ball is gonna roll down the hill to you at the bottom of the hill, all right? Yeah. Because, it, because that's what it does. It's got that potential energy and it wants to go down its concentration gradient. That's going to do. And that's perfect. If I want that ball to do work for me, I could either use my own energy to yell something to you, or I could write it on a piece of paper and tape it to the ball. Then I let the ball go and the ball you does the work of rolling down the hill to you and you get the message that way. Okay. I think I got that part. Yeah. But on so, the... Yeah, so sodium coming in is just the energy that we're using here to bring the glucose in. But this co-transporter only works if sodium wants to come in. Think of it this way. If I had 10 sodium outside of the cell and I had six sodium inside the cell, sodium would want to come in. And so what would happen is one sodium would come inside, bringing a glucose with it, but then we would only have nine out here and we would have seven out here. Yeah. And then a second sodium comes in, bringing a glucose. And now we have eight sodium out here and eight sodium inside the cell. If there's eight sodium outside the cell and eight sodium inside the cell, does sodium want to come in anymore? No. No. And so it won't do work anymore. So the only way we can get this co-transporter to do work is as soon as one of those sodiums come in, we have to then kick it out of the cell. So by kicking this out, we always keep the, low, the number low on the inside and we don't let it build up sodium on the inside. Okay. So yes, yeah, so this is where we're using our ATP to get sodium to go where it doesn't wanna to go to kick it out. But this isn't a co-transporter. Sodium doesn't wanna go out. So I have to use that ATP. I use the energy of that ATP to kick the sodium out. And one of the things that commonly does this is our sodium potassium ATPase, right? That kicks out uh, three sodiums and brings in two potassiums or something like that. So again, there's all sorts of different types of pumps that could be involved, but the key is we need to get that sodium out. 
Once okay. sodium and glucose are inside the cell, they're not connected to each other. They were never connected to each other. They just came in the same door. Okay. I think that, okay, I got it. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Great questions. Any others? Because again, this is what we're going to do for all of them. So if you don't understand on this one, it's just going to get worse when we get to the next ones. All right, perfect. Now that it's in the interstitial fluid, which of the two capillary types does it enter? Which of the two capillary types is it gonna enter? Excellent, enters the blood capillary. Perfect. So once the glucose gets out here, it enters into a blood capillary. And now trace that path to the heart. That blood capillary feeds into what blood vessel first? Hepatic, hepatic portal vein? Before the hepatic portal vein, not a bad guess, but we need to start with, okay, true, the arterioles, but, and those arterioles feed into, let's get something with a name. What's the first excellent, an intestinal vein. That intestinal vein, remember we're in the small intestine, is gonna feed into the Excellent. Superior mesenteric vein, which feeds into what? There we go. Now we get the hepatic portal vein. Which feeds into what? What does the hepatic portal vein feed into before the hepatic vein? True, into the liver. But what blood vessel? We're just following the blood vessels now. What blood vessel, what blood vessel does a hepatic portal vein feed into? There we go. Sinusoid capillary. Which feeds into central vein which feeds into hepatic vein. Hey, no fair getting ahead of me. Which feeds into I was just kidding. It's okay to get ahead of me. Excellent. Inferior vena cava, which feeds into See how easy that was? And there you go. That's all you need to know for the breakdown and absorption of carbohydrates. Questions on that? This is how you want us to describe this process. These are all the pieces of information that I want. How you provide that information for me is up to you. If, for instance, you want to follow the path of the carbohydrate, say, all right, the carbohydrate starts in the mouth. In the mouth, it is broken down mechanically by mastication. It is broken down chemically by salivary amylase. It is then swallowed into the stomach where it is broken down mechanically by churning, which then moves it into the small intestine where segmentation and pancreatic amylase and brush border enzymes and all that. Again, I don't care how you provide me with this information as long as you provide me with all this information. I, again, I, because the way my mind works, these are the things I want. Mechanical breakdown of where it occurs, chemical breakdown of where it occurs, right? How it gets across the two membranes, right? And then where it goes after that. So that's how I compartmentalized my information and obviously what's broken down into monosaccharides. But however you describe it is completely up to you. I just want to make sure that all of this information is there.
yeah, there's no one way to provide this information. Just make sure that you do it. Yeah, you're welcome to use bullet lists. That's totally fine to be able to do something like that. Again, it doesn't have to be complete sentences. Notice I just said mastication, mouth, churning, stomach, right? It doesn't have to be complete sentences. However, the only thing that I would remind you is remember, you do have, while you don't need complete sentences, uh, you do need to make sure you have all the information. And the one thing that sometimes happens when people use bullet points is they're too brief in their information. Uh, remember, don't be brief on your information. So yeah, it doesn't have to be complete sentences. It doesn't have to be paragraphs. Uh, bullet points are fine. Separating like this is fine. However you provide me with that information is fine. Just make sure all the information is there. All right. Questions on that? All right, well, hopefully this has given you something to think about. This is all the information that I wanted to cover for today. As I mentioned, we're gonna finish a little early today. We'll finish a little early on, uh, on Thursday as well. But this hopefully uh, gives you some uh, thought, some pause to go and look at this material and prepare yourself for Thursday's, ex uh, for Thursday's not exam, but for Thursday's lecture. All righty. Questions on any of this? All right, perfect. Then that is everything I have for you for today. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask one last time if there's any questions. All right, then I will go ahead and stop the recording. You guys have a good and safe day and I will see you, uh, hold on. Uh, well, there'll be four pathways, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and there will be one more. So we'll talk about that uh, uh, in the next class. But now you've seen what I want for the carbohydrates and we'll do the exact same thing for lipids. And we'll do the exact same thing for proteins as well. All right, excellent. Any other questions? All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.